the content of this meeting is being sent to a third party. What does that mean? Oh, because sure? it's going on YouTube. All right, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Jeepers. <laughs> I just like these other people in. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Lanarkshire Family History Society's webinar for January. Happy New Year to you all. I hope you had a lovely time over the holidays. Um, my name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. Um, we would be obliged if you would turn off your cameras and your sound just until the presentation is over. Um, it hopefully will help keep the background noise to a minimum and then everyone can enjoy the webinar. And fingers crossed there will be no delays or any screens freezing as well. Um, pop, a, pop a note into the chat box and tell us where you're watching from today. Um, and also, do you have any New Year research resolutions? Uh, mine is to um, probably read a bit more. Um, I said that last year and it didn't really happen. Um, and also try and spend a bit more time doing my own research, my own family tree. Um, family tree because um, I spend a lot of time doing client stuff so <laughs> it's just nice to delve into your own. Um, the website um, is almost complete, you can use it and the store is now live. Um, you can actually go in, there's a page where you can register for forthcoming presentations and there's also a page where you can watch past presentations. I'll put a link into the chat box. Um, just just note that we are doing final checks at the moment to make sure that the layout um, is looking okay, depending on what browser and what device you're, use, you're using. So just bear with us. And if you do happen to come across any minor glitches or things that don't look quite right, we would appreciate it if you would get in touch via the contact box. Um, so our speaker this evening is Christine Woodcock from Genealogy Tours of Scotland. Um, she's going to be providing a presentation on symbols of eternity, understanding gravestone symbolism. Symbolism. Christine, how are you? I'm good. I'm fascinated reading the um, comments about where people are from. Look, Tenerife. Wow. Uh, and then Dennis said that his New Year resolution is to use DNA properly, which I think is fabulous. Do you know, I think as well, I probably could take a leaf out of your book. I kind of understand the DNA, but I don't probably spend as much time as I should going in and checking the results. Um, I think it's, it's kind of forgotten about at times unless you get an alert from them. So, yeah, maybe a, a point to, to say, right, put a, a note in the, the, the diary once a month to say, go in and check your DNA. Check it out. Yeah, has anything changed? Um, Lanarkshire, Edmonton, Alberta in Canada, Kirstiers Junction. Uh, recently retired and resolution this year is to review my family tree. That's a good one. Salt Lake City, Utah, Bathgate, West Lothian. Quite a variety um, of places covered actually. Can look. Welcome. Um, so, Christine, you got any New Year research resolutions? No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Last year I worked at. Um, uh, Oh, um, digitizing, hmm. getting stuff scanned and organized that way. So I actually made some good headway on that, but I haven't got around to <clears throat> making any resolutions yet this year. Yeah, I did a bit of that. I got a lot of the stuff that was in folders digitized so that I don't have folders. It's photographs. You, I know you you did photographs last year, didn't you? I've done all my photographs. It's but what I well, and now what I need to do is to go buy it back and. I put descriptions in them all right yeah. but um i need to get more of the folders out i actually had a whole lot of um remember in the day when you used to go to scotland's people and you could download to a usb mm -hmm. so i had a lot of those that i hadn't done anything with right as horrible as that is to say because that's a long time ago but i've done that now yeah so it's only taken me a decade but i've got it under hand I think it's too easy to actually download a lot of stuff and put it into folders. Yeah. And sit and sort it. I think I've got one that's old when they gave you free access to maybe the news one of the newspaper archives. I right. saved a lot of stuff and they're just all sitting in a folder. So I need to Yeah. 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 So it's getting the folders cleared. Uh, Barry's saying his resolutions are daily. <laughs> I wish Make I could it through the day. 
that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had time to do my research every day. Okay, Christine, I'll hand over to you. I'm hoping that some of these um, gravestones that you're going to show will feature some of the stones that we looked at last year when we were on a, a, a wee trip. They do, actually. They do. <laughs> Uh, there were some interesting ones. Yeah. Just need to close all this stuff out. And oh, let's start at the beginning. All right. So I'm going to close out my camera, actually. And I'll move this full bar. There we go. Okay. So we're going to look at some of the symbols that we commonly find and perhaps not so commonly find on um, gravestones as we're wandering cemeteries. Uh, I quite like this quote. It's, I'm outdoorsy in that I like to wander around cemeteries, and I can't think of a family historian who doesn't like to do that. I don't even have to know anybody who's buried in it. I just like to go wander. And I know last year, when I was with Claire, um, we were out for a day trip and actually stopped at an old cemetery and wandered around it. And it was just, uh, it was fabulous. Lots of interesting stuff that we found in there. So most of us are known as a taphophile. And a taphophile, the word comes from ancient Greek, uh, talking about funeral rites or burial and the English file. So it's a person who's interested in cemeteries, funerals, gravestones. Which is really most family historians or genealogists. There used to be a blog prompt actually, Claire, um, a number of years ago, and it was Taphophile Tuesday, and people would put up um, a blog post every Tuesday about a different gravestone that they had in their various, their, their uh, collection of various tombstones as we, we go through our research. So for most part, we, we get the, um, you know, to the fairly standard memento mori stuff, which is uh, that death waits for no one. We have the grave digger tools. This is fairly standard on a lot of them. Uh, the Grim Reaper, or the Skeleton of Death. So just on this one, this stone is uh, in Greyfriars in Edinburgh, and absolutely fascinates me just because of all of the symbolism that's on it. So we have the Grim Reaper, we have the Bible, we have ropes and a noose, which is kind of interesting, you don't always see that. We have knives, we have the skull and crossbones down here, we have the grave digger tools, and I'm not sure, but when you blow this up to look at it, it actually looks to be syringes and shears. So I wasn't sure if it was maybe, um, I can't find any information on this particular stone. Um, I wasn't sure if maybe it was a, a barber or a dentist or somebody who would be using those tools. In terms of the picture stones, these are uh, from the uh, Governor Church. And these, this one is called the Sunstone, and it has in it here four snakes that you can see that are coming out from uh, a boss in the circle in the center. And the placement of them re resembles the sun, and which is how it got its name, the Sunstone. And then we have here the Cutty Stain, which the carving shows Jesus being carried into Jerusalem on, on Palm Sunday. These warrior grave slabs, uh, people will be familiar with them. This is in Kilmartin Glen. Um, and again, uh, they're uh, more medieval. This stone is also in Kilmartin Glen in the uh, church there. And if you look, you can see uh, up ahead there, you have the crucifix in the circle. And then on the stem, you have the torch. And the torch is really just lighting the way to heaven. Lots of religious symbolism on the stones. We have the crown, which symbolizes God. The angel, which is the messenger of God. The laurel leaves signify victory over death. The cross, which is Jesus or Christianity. 
fish. You'll often see fish as well, which uh, symbolizes Jesus or Christianity. This one is Jesus welcoming the deceased to heaven. This is a Madonna and child surrounded by cherubs. I'm just going to go back to this um, stone here. It This one is from August 1750. And although it has a lot of religious um, symbols on it, it says on it uh, at, at the bottom, I believe, August 1750, here was interred the corpse of Mary Young, spouse to John Riddick, one of the magistrates of Kirkwall, and afterwards provost of the said borough. She lived regarded and died regretted. And that is in Kirkwall uh, Cathedral. The finger pointing heavenward. Star of David, which symbolizes that the deceased was Jewish. The book or the Bible. Now, this is sometimes open and sometimes closed. Um, just really depends. And sometimes there's writing on it and sometimes there isn't. Just depends on the stonemason, I suppose. Clasped hands generally signify a husband and wife joined in eternity. These ones fascinate me. These are in the necropolis in Glasgow, and they they look like they've been vandalized. The tops have been lopped off of them. But in fact, what they're signifying is that the person was cut down in the prime of their life. So they died uh, quite young, probably in their 20s or 30s. The Wheel of Life. Often you'll see an urn, it can be draped or undraped. And that really is just carrying the, it's a vessel really to carry the deceased to heaven. The fruit at the top here represents a plentiful eternity. We'll often see uh, a lamb, and that generally represents that the deceased was a child or was an infant. Again, the open Bible and cherubs, religion and spiritual resurrection. Many of the symbol, the um, headstones will have symbols for the person's occupation, the deceased's occupation. Claire, you might recognize this photo. And actually I took it when we were at the uh, Museum of Rural Life. Right, so on this one, we can see that the person was a barber. We have here on the left, we have the bowl, we have the razors uh, and comb, or the razor here, and then the comb right here. And then we have the usual, uh, the memento mori stuff, the, the crossbones, the uh, hourglass that time waits for no one. And uh, I suppose that's supposed to be the Grim Reaper's face. This one uh, shows that the person was a groomsman and you can see in here the horse uh, and the saddle. Really very, very ornate. Um, I'm, it's unfortunate that this part here, which talks about, you know, the occupation of what he did in his life wasn't larger and less of the, the um, finials around it. <clears throat> this one is a blacksmith and you can see uh, the crown of course is for God, but you can also see the anvil and the hammer. And uh, you can see in here, uh, the horseshoe. Fisherman, so uh, this is his boat and his anchor and then the fish. Fireman, uh, you can see the hat 
And this is for William Waddle, late fire master who died August 16th, 1932, uh, was in service of the fire brigade for 45 years from the members of the Glasgow Fire Brigade. I ready, of course, being their motto. <clears throat> A tailor, uh, so you can see the scissors and the iron. Shipwright, you can see the ship, the saw, uh, sorry, the saw and the hammer, uh, the axe, and you can see over here the compass. Uh, this one is, uh, it's called Sting and Ling, and it shows that the person was a brewer's man. So you can see the keg. Um, and then the grave stickers, tools, and, and the skull from here. So this is a weaver, and this weaver is seated at his loom. Uh, and then you have the angel of death, and then you have the, the crown for God. Quite honestly, I had to do some... Um, serious thinking about this and some reading about it to find out that that was a loom because to me it you know it could have been a writer at his desk as well captain of a ship and it says actually here captain don gray and you can see ship in here and then the anchor an incredible amount of craftsmanship in some of these really <clears throat> this one was a seaman, uh, so he was a sailor or a captain or a ship owner. On some fairly rough seas by the looks of things. This one has uh, stonemason's emblems. So he's got uh, the shield and the uh, crown and hammer. Um, for uh, the um, crown and hammer for the blacksmith and then um, the, uh, the shield. <clears throat> this one is a stonemason as well. And um, in one hand, he's holding a mel, which is a cutter's stone. Oh, sorry, a cutter's hammer. And then in his other hand down here, if you look closely, you can see a, a chisel. So here we see the Masonic symbol as well as tools of the trade for a Mason. Um, on the top, we have uh, this, um, a man in an apron up at the top here. And then on the left, this is Adam and Eve, uh, uh, the tree with the apple. And then in here are the Masonic uh, symbols. All right, so this one is in Ayrshire, and this is, believe it or not, these are mermaids. So these are the Ayrshire mermaids, they're known as, and it's a symbol that was commonly used for merchants. We can also see in the center here, uh, a hand holding the wheel of life. This headstone is for William and Margaret Linent, or Linent. The date at the top reads 1687. The headstone curiously is broken into compartments. So you have a compartment up here with uh, William and Margaret. You have a compartment here, here, and then down at the bottom. So down at the bottom here, you have the hourglass and what looks like an infant. Um, this looks like a millstone, so he could well have been a miller. 
and these may be tools of his trade as a miller. So it's possible that this long um, carving here was in fact something like a rolling pin or perhaps a pin that held the grinding stones together. Again, you can see Adam and Eve and the serpent and the tree. And then down in here, you can see um, the symbols of a tailor. So this actually is known as the Ritchie headstone. It's from uh, Lundy in, Ag in Angus, and it was erected in memory of the children of a tailor. So you can see, as I said here, you can see his tools of the trade. And um, on either side are lit torts to light the way to heaven for the children. Um, sorry, this, the one on, um, yeah, they're both lit. Sometimes you'll see them lit or unlit. It's just, uh, they're both lit on this one. I wanted to check. This one is a farmer and you can see that, uh, he's represented. He's got his oxen down here, his plow. Uh, probably workers. And then you can see the Grim Reaper in here, the hourglass, just uh, quite a bit of symbolism really in here. You've got the Bible over here and the angels. This one is a jeweler. He actually was a, it's for um, George Harriet. It's a, in uh, Greyfriars in Edinburgh. And he was actually a jeweler to uh, the monarchy. So he, um, as a benefactor, he left his money uh, to be used for a school for uh, fatherless boys. And the school is situated next to the graveyard. And interestingly enough, this headstone is, I um, believe, on the wall uh, that separates the graveyard from the schoolyard. Uh, the rest of it, most of the symbolism represents memento mori. Um, and you can see, though, the large ring uh, here, the jeweler. Uh, to symbolize that he was a jeweler. It was known as the Coachman's Stone. It's in the Cannon Gate, uh, and it's to commemorate the coachman who drove the Edinburgh to London coach. It left from Whitehorse Close in the Cannon Gate, and several of the drivers uh, who were coachmen are actually interred in the Cannon Gate Kirkyard. This is in the Glasgow Necropolis and it is for a playwright and actor. It's the tombstone of Don Henry Alexander. He was an actor, a playwright and manager of the Theater Royal. The stone is built to represent a flanked stage on either side, they have um, comedy and tragedy. One of these has gone missing. Oops, I'm sorry. Statue for tragedy is the one that has gone missing and comedy, interestingly enough, has lost its head. The comedy statue is holding a mask for comedy in its hand. You can see that down in here. The center is made to look like the theater with curtains. And the inscription down here reads, Fallen is the curtain, the last scene is o'er. The favorite actor treads life stage no more. Oft lavish plaudits from the crowd he drew, and laughing eyes confessed his humor true. Here fond affection rears the sculptured stone, for virtues not enacted but his own. A constancy unshaken unto death, a true unswerving and Christian's faith, who knew him best have caused to mourn him most. Oh, weep the man no more, the actor lost. Un unnumbered parts he played into the end. His best were those of hu husband, father, friend. This is the mausoleum for the Adam family of architects. And uh, we can see that the people in turn, who the people were that were interned, and we can see a large architectural drawing uh, down here in the center. 
uh, below the bus. This is uh, William Adam. It was originally built, the, the tombstone, the mausoleum was originally built uh, for uh, William's sons, Robert and John. Or sorry, built by the sons, Robert and John, for the father, William. But Robert and John are also interred here, as is uh, William's wife, Jean. And of course, you often come across some rather unusual headstones, which really are the ones that as family historians and genealogists kind of fascinate us the most, right? This is in, um, I have to think about it, uh, Ramsborn, sorry, in Glasgow. And it's burying ground for strangers in 1815. So it was just people passing through, I guess, uh, had died and, and were buried in the parish and then a uh, stone laid over. This one, uh, Claire, this is one of the ones that we saw as we were going around uh, the old Concarden yard. And this says, thus had enclosed the ashes of his deeply deplored relations. Um, but it didn't mean that he deplored them. It meant that they were in deep mourning and deplored his passing. This is another, this one I think is in um, the old Colton Cemetery in Edinburgh. That looks like Hume's tomb at the back there. Uh, and it says on it, deeply regretted. So it says in all of that, sacred to the memory of the Reverend Thomas Thompson, Thomas Thompson, minister of the Relief Congregation, St. James Place, Edinburgh. After a long illness, which was born with exemplary patience, he departed this life on the 16th of April, 1819, in the 62nd year of his age and 40th of his ministry. Deeply regretted by all his friends and particularly his congregation, who in token of their respect for the piety and worth of his character, all of their grateful recollection of his fidelity and tenderness as a pastor, erected this monument as a mournful tribute to of affection to his virtues which is rather lovely. Now down in here, this is the piece that really kind of fascinated me. It gives the size of the, the, the tomb or the um, grave. It says size of ground, eight feet by 10. This is a rather uh, weathered stone and it is from um, the Old Kirk Yard in Galloway. Fortunately, they have the pattern right next to it. And um, because it's really, as you can see, it's in really rough shape. But the cast is set uh, next to it here and we can see the crown at the top. Uh, of course, symbolizing God. We can see uh, the hourglass. Uh, we can see the crossbones. There's a horse in the middle here, believe it or not, or there's the head of the horse. Um, and the man putting uh, shoes on the horse. And above the horse, we see um, some spanners. So again, likely to be a, um, a blacksmith or a grimsman, but likely a blacksmith. This one is, this is interesting to me because um, when you look at it, you have to wonder if he was a jailer or because it looks to me, and I could be wrong, but it looks to me like the top here is um, a hangman's gallows. And then we have the lock and key down here. Looks like the name was Bertram and it's 1692. This is the old Bach of Stone uh, from Concarden Old Cemetery. Uh, this one is one that Claire and I came across as well. The inscription reads, here lies the corpse of Janet Ferguson, spouse to William Backup, who departed this life November 27, 
1750, aged 50, uh, and one daughter. And we can see William at the top in the center. We can see two women here. Um, I'm When I first saw it, I thought this may have been his mother or mother-in-law and his wife, um, Janet, who is also buried here. You can see the Bible. And then there are uh, 10 children. So there are four boys here and a girl and then five boys here. One, uh, so there's one female and nine boys. Apparently, locally, it's known as the Crooked family, uh, as all of the children seem to have an abnormality. However, it's more likely the carving uh, being rather rudimentary uh, than the fact that all the children were disabled in some way or disfigured in some way. This is the Dance of Death. This is actually in the crypt of the uh, in the basement of um, Roslyn Chapel. So barely visible on the left side of the slab are the words Omnia Mors, Equat, which translates to death equals all things. Standing on the far left is a crowned skeleton holding a scythe. And the scythe is a symbol used by ancient gravekeepers uh, to maintain uh, to maintain the um, the graves. Um, it's also a symbol of death. The crowned skeleton is referred to as the king of terrors. So that's this person right here, the Grim Reaper. But he's got a crown, so he's the uh, king of terrors or the king of death. Over here, we see a naked pauper. And here we see uh, a king, and the king is sitting on his throne. Because these are almost the same height, thanks to whatever he's standing on, this is supposed to symbolize that death is the great equalizer. Although death is coming for us all, um, regardless of our statue in life, it equalizes us uh, in the afterlife. So these are um, away from the Scottish cemeteries now and into uh, Canadian cemeteries. This is a headstone uh, for passengers of the Titanic and they are in the Catholic cemetery in Halifax. And you can see, oh no, sorry, this is, uh, that's not what this is at all. Uh, this is um, this cross was originally in St. Don's Anglican Church in Halifax. It was moved to the cemetery to commemorate the lives of the early settlers who were buried in the cemetery but are in unmarked graves. This is the tombstone of an advocate. This is the Titanic gravesite in Halifax. Stones are arranged on their plinths and they're designed to look like an upturned ship. If you stand at a distance, you can sort of see how that works. <laughs> this is where they are two stones. Uh, they So they have the name uh, and they all have the same date of death, of course, April 15th, 1912, which was when the um, Titanic sank. The these two are in the Catholic cemetery and there are numbers at the bottom. So this one has on the left has number 12 and the one on the right has number one, 196. And that's just the number, um, the order in which they were recovered from the sea. Now, interestingly enough for the Titanic, um, it was off the coast, well, sort of between Halifax and um, uh, New York, but all of the live bodies went to New York while the dead bodies seem to come to Halifax. Unless they knew for sure uh, who the person was. So for instance, um, one of the Astors, one of the John Jacob Astors or Don Astors was, died on the Titanic. But so because he was um, well known, he his body was then taken to uh, New York. 
And these are um, markers for unknown victims of the Titanic. So again, they're numbered. You can see there's 139, 219, and 308. And again, that's just the order in which they were retrieved from the sea. When the bodies were um, re retrieved, they were assigned a number and they were all given a canvas bag. And then inside the bag were all of their effects that had been found with them or near them. So this is, it says erected to the memory of an unknown child. Um, but some research has uh, since uncovered the name of the child. So um, he, it says, uh, erected to the memory of an unknown child whose remains were recovered after the disaster to the Titanic, April 15th, 1912. <laughs> In 2008, some mitochondrial DNA testing by the armed forces revealed that this uh, child is actually Sidney Leslie Goodwin. Uh, he was not uh, not quite two years old, about a year and a half. So he was born September 9th, 1910, and he died April 15th, 1912. He was the 19-month-old son of Joseph Goodwin and Augusta Taylor, or Tyler. Two of his brothers were also recovered and subsequently identified through DNA testing. So there was a big news conference that took place after the DNA test came back um, identifying this child. And uh, so the whole family actually were on the Titanic. The whole family, I believe, were all lost at sea. Uh, well, they all died at sea. Um, they were recovered. And um, uh, so anyway, after this news conference, they had um, a family from Ontario. So this is in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And a family from Ontario contacted um, the Maritime Museum in Halifax, which has a permanent display, uh, a permanent exhibit to the Titanic. It's actually quite a large um, part of the museum and it's really quite fascinating if you ever get the chance to go through it. So this family from Ontario contacted the Maritime Museum and they said, we have these and they belong to that boy. These are his shoes. So they said that their grandfather was Sergeant Clarence Northover of the Halifax police. And Clarence had been in charge of guarding the bodies that were recovered from the Titanic. He said that Northover had told them that the victims' families had said that all clothing be belonging to the deceased should be burned, but the police officer could not bring himself to destroying those tiny little pair of shoes. So he kept them in a drawer in his desk until he retired. On the bottom of the shoes, it says he had written, um, presumably in, um, I guess in ink or perhaps a, a marker, shoes of the only baby found, SS Titanic 1912. This is also in uh, the Fairlawn Cemetery at um, Fairview Cemetery in Halifax. And it is a stone to the memory of the unidentified dead who were victims of the great disaster of December 6, 1917. And it says, here lie buried unidentified victims of the Halifax Harbor explosion of December 6, 1917. So Halifax, um, you know, in 1912, they had the Titanic and they had all of the bodies come in from that. Uh, five years later, or five and a half years later, there was a massive explosion as uh, two ships collided in the, in the harbor. One of them was filled to the brim, uh, probably overfilled to the brim with explosives, but there was no indication um, to any of the other ships that, that it contained explosives, unfortunately. And it blew out, well, I, hundreds of people died, but you know, it blew out um, homes, it blew out windows, the, there were shards of glass everywhere. And actually there were so many people blinded by the shrapnel and the shards of glass that um, it was because of this disaster that the Canadian National Institute for the Blind was established to help people live with their newfound blindness. Every year on the anniversary of the um, explosion, the local newspaper uh, runs a photograph on the front page that has all of the coffins lined up outside uh, the arena because there weren't enough, um, there wasn't enough space to house them within the, the um, 
there wasn't enough space to house them within the um the uh funeral home sorry this is the catholic cemetery mount olivet in halifax and uh it's interesting because you can see all of these ye yellow poles which um you know may indicate the cables are buried underneath for some people it's it's hard to say but in fact when you look closer at them they have names and ages printed on them and again these are people who died in the explosion so because they were there was an explosion you really had body fragments you didn't have full bodies a lot of the time to bury and uh so the um people were you know their their pieces were buried and then they have still been commemorated by uh, having these posts all throughout the cemetery And then this one um, was, this is a stone that's been erected in loving memory of my dear husband, Reuben Johnson, killed by explosion, December 6, 1917, in his 49th year. And there are also quite a few headstones, all say, killed by explosion. To the unified, unidentified Catholic dead, killed in explosion, um, rest in peace. So in the um, Catholic cemetery, we have the unidentified Catholic dead. And in the main cemetery, the, the, the municipal cemetery, it's uh, just a mass grave to those who died in the explosion. This passenger of the Titanic is buried in the Catholic cemetery. So it must have been known at some point that he, in fact, was uh, Catholic. Graveyard is the richest place on the face on the surface of the earth because here you will see the books that were not published, ideas that were not harnessed, songs that were not sung, and Brahma pieces that were never acted. And that would be it. Amazing, Christine. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I can't seem to find my camera. My <laughs> little bar's gone. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Um, we've got a few kind of comments um, in the chat. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, before I move on to that, one thing that while you were going through it, I kind of thought was if anyone was to have something on their gravestone that summed them up what would it be and why so yeah put your comments on that in the chat um i mean it could be anything from your trades to the place that you live to hobbies or be really interesting to see you know what people would put nowadays um, i was actually um out for a trail walk last maybe two weeks ago now and um it starts and ends in the cemetery we parked at the um at the uh in the parking lot at the cemetery and there was a gravestone that had a motorcycle engraved on it. So obviously a motorcycle enthusiast. Um, I'm just noticing John has put down, worth noting that when a crown is associated with craft or working tools, it can signify a master craftsman as opposed to a crown, um, which can signify divine love. Um, Carol's, Carol said, what did the wheel of life represent does it just mean life or the circle of life circle of life yeah um john has commented wheels often represent life eternal but it would depend on the context of either symbols on the stone for example a wheel right um i've put a comment saying i was hoping that you would <laughs> include the stone with all the little kids on it because i can remember that day that we found it um mm -hmm. and actually do you know I'd, that day we had such a great day going around that cemetery because there was so many that had symbols on it wasn't there yeah yeah um dennis had there's said, so many unusual stones in that yeah yeah right I mean, yeah i mean when i go come to a cemetery and it's i've never been in it before and my husband and me take a scout about i'll say to him let me know if you find any with symbols on them because i always make a point of, of taking pictures of them and i've got folders and folders of them so if you ever run short give me a shout <laughs> 
Um, Dennis said the hangman stone looks more like a printing press. Ah. And the tools would be for hammering down the metal lettering. I there you go. I actually thought wine press, but that makes more sense. I yeah, it does. Look like a press, but I was thinking wine press. But a printing press would actually make sense. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. And then John said old letter font press used for early publications. He's put an attachment, but every time I go to open it, John, it keeps saying it could be. Bam. Bam. I don't know if you can get it, Christine. Um, Dennis had said my ancestor Patrick um, McElhenney lived in Halifax at that time and was a seaman on the Mackay Brown, a cable ship used to recover the Titanic bodies. Wow. Well, I know it was one of those things when I started doing my family tree, I looked up the list of all the people on the Titanic. Because you think, well, what you know, what if you had someone that travelled on the Titanic? Yeah. There are lists available online for it. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. So what is your favourite, do you think, out of them all? Uh, it's hard to say, but I, I mean, that one really raised my curiosity, the one with all the children. Um, I think in terms of spectacular, the playwright, mm -hmm. um, you know, that that was really, yeah. uh, quite, really nice yeah, and it's so detailed. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of being moved, the ones that are in Halifax, either to the Titanic or to the explosion. Right. All right, John's... John, the problem with the file got, is I've the extension. It it's a web page. Hang on a minute. Oh, okay. Got... Oh. Let me just. Oh yeah. Let me just see if I can share. My yes, because there's the printing press. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Do you see that on the on the right hand side there, Claire? Oh yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I need somebody that's with that. Actually, interesting. Actually, my I don't know how many times great grandfather was the he learned on printing presses. And then um, it was it was the kind of journal. It was the, the editor editor. That's the word I'm looking for of the Inverness Courier. Oh, is that right? Did you read? Um, did you just read the one Patrick McElhenney lived in Halifax at the time? Was a seaman on the Mackay Brown? Yeah. Or Mackay Brown cable yeah. ship used to recover the bodies. Yeah. Jesus. Mm hmm. That's not a great job. No. No. Um, quite a few thanks for your presentation. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the presentation. Yep, really enjoyable, Christine. Really enjoyable. Do you ever find that you look into the people or do you just kind of look at the symbols and try and decipher it from that? Um, I've done both. Mm -hmm. I, I have done both. Um. It depends because sometimes if it's, you know, if it's way back when you don't really mm. get it right with the OPRs, but some of the newer ones I have. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, you know what? I've got enough to do, <laughs> 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 but sometimes, you know what you wind up, it's just, it's a rabbit hole for us. Right. We just I think, know. Oh, that's an interesting one. Let's go find out more. Yeah. I, I know. No, that is definitely, that is definitely. Um, okay. Let me just, run on with a couple of other um just a quick mention actually in relation to the Kilted Ancestors group that Christine and myself run we've just released the monthly um, prompts for this year and they all focus on sharing so that would be sharing stories of your Scottish ancestry um you can read more via the recent blog article um let me just put that in there I think another comment there. Diana says, this one is from Methven in Persia that you showed just before the Ayrshire mm. Mermaid one. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're from all over. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, and I thought I would include a few from Canada as well. Yeah, no, that was nice. Um, I think it was nice it was at the Titanic ones as well. Um, Oh, Diana's put the image actually into the um, the chat. I'm 
John says, a copy PDF for you. A wee booklet of a graveyard in Lanarkshire, including info on symbols for the for you folks. So if you want to go in and download that book. I'm hoping that it's quite safe, John. <laughs> Not like the last one. Um, Diana's shared an image as well. Thanks, John. John says very safe. I'll have a wee look at that later on. <laughs> Um, so let me just run through. The next webinar will be on Thursday the 8th of February at 7pm. Um, the speaker will be Robert Friel of Stonehouse Heritage Group and he's going to come and talk to us about the parish of Stonehouse in Lanarkshire. So if you have anyone from Stonehouse, um, come along and um, sign up. There was somebody put in the chat that that's where they're from tonight. Stonehouse? Who was from yeah. Stonehouse? I know they said from a very dark portion. Oh, John's from, oh there you go, John. <laughs> the link's in the chat. The link's in the chat. Get signed up. <laughs> um, so yeah, Robert's coming to talk to us about Stonehouse. Um, and just a quick reminder, if you're not already a member of Lanarkshire Family History Society, um, why not join? Um, membership starts at just £10. For that, you get three journals per year, monthly e-news, and also use of the Society's Research Centre in Motherwell. Um, John saying, Stonehouse, dead, dead, centre. dead centre of the universe. I'm sure Robert, <laughs> you, you'll probably know Robert, it's like one of those little places. <laughs> Christine's dogs have just, is it your dogs, Christine? Yeah, have just went wild. <laughs> Um, just a quick reminder that obviously the Lanarkshire website um, is now live, the, the shop's um, up and running as well, I've just posted some details in the chat. Um, you can actually sign up for all the events that are taking place between now and June and there's also a page under the resources section that you can go in and go back and watch all the previous webinars, I think they start in 2021. So if you're looking for something to do over the winter, um, get onto the website and have a quick look at some of the past webinars. There's a, an array of topics and a whole array of speakers as well. Um, so before we finish up, Christine, thank you again for your presentation. It's been lovely seeing you. Um, next time we see you, you'll be on this side of the pond. I will. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Look forward to seeing you in February. Take care. Bye.